Oh, hello everybody, and welcome to the very last episode of season two, All About You. Hasn't it been just a wonderful ride? Todd and I are not going to be doing a separate episode about our final thoughts, so I just thought I would smatter some up the top um, just before we get into the very last one, because I really think it's worth mentioning how important this season of the podcast has been and how rewarding it has been. So basically, I've come to realize that it's so important to speak out for people who cannot do it themselves. And if you can understand, it's kind of weird to speak out and be like a public figure, like talking publicly about things you've never experienced before. And that's what I did with all of these issues. There was, this is the 10th episode of things that we talk about that I've never experienced before. And that's super weird. But it has been the best learning experience that we should be spokespeople for things that we don't experience ourselves. And this is why. So if you remember back to episode two, which is also the first topic we talk about, which is chronic illness, I mentioned that both of the blogs that have been submitted were anonymous. And basically, it's challenging for people with chronic illness to talk about the issues they're facing and still be eligible for jobs and not face discrimination in the workplace. Since publishing that episode, it is the most listened to episode out of this whole season, which just goes to show that voices needed to be had for people with chronic illness and this conversation needed to be had. So it really opened my eyes to using our privilege and using our abilities to speak up when we can because some people who are facing issues may not be able to speak up about it. I just did an interview recently with Joe Buck um, who was talking about how he fought for a sexism case at his university and the only reason that the professor in question saw any reprimanding, saw any penalties to his career was the fact that a white man fought that battle instead of the woman that was impacted. So this whole series has really shown to me the importance of speaking up when we can, even if we haven't gone through these issues ourselves. Just being an ally is huge, it makes such a huge difference and I don't think I fully understood how much of a huge difference until I did this season of the podcast. So thank you so much to everyone who submitted a blog who was featured in this podcast and who allowed Todd and I to empathize and to learn about what you're going through in a more deep and personal way. And thank you for everyone who's reached out who has also experienced some of the stuff we've talked about in these podcasts. I have love hearing your stories. I've loved connecting with you. And thank you to all the listeners because without you guys listening, we we wouldn't have this conversation we wouldn't have this understanding this empathy so thank you for joining the conversation and it's so crazy to think now that some of these episodes are circulating in businesses in organizations and universities as resources for people to learn more about the different types of conservationists they may have in their organization so this series this season was just such a whirlwind such an amazing journey And who knows, if we get more blogs with different themes that I've never experienced, maybe we'll have enough to do a season three, but we'll watch out for that in the future. So with that, I will leave you with our very last episode. And it's one of the great ones. Like, it's amazing. You will love it. We're ending with a bang. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hello and welcome to the How to Conserve Conservationist podcast, season two, all about you. I am Jesse. I am Tar. And together we're going to be talking about episode 10, Conservation Dogs. And you might be thinking, what? <laughs> and I wanted to chuck Conservation Dogs in here because it's like, it's not something that a lot of people can relate to working with Conservation Dogs, but I knew it's a I know it's something that's more common, working in conservation with co-workers that aren't necessarily human. And I thought because that comes with its own challenges that I would put this episode in because of, I think in the future, it's going to be way more common not to like to have non-human colleagues and co-workers. So if that is you and you work with a conservation dog or horse or (laughs) some kind of animal, maybe you're a falconer. 
maybe these uh, this podcast will resonate with you. When you said that, I was just thinking of like some dystopian robotic future of like <laughs> post post humanism. Like, not all your co workers will be human in the future. Yeah, totally. We just, just have to get used to that. Um, trigger warning as well on this one. The second blog we talk about did just bring Todd to tears. So um, you know that uh, the episode, what is it called? The website where you check if a dog dies before you watch a movie just to see if you want to watch that movie. This uh, episode might be a bit Marley and me for some people. <laughs> um, there is, unfortunately, uh, the second blog is kind of an ode to a canine co-worker that didn't quite make it. And I wanted to state that the very start of the podcast because if you're one of those people who goes on the website to find out if the dog dies to see if you do or don't want to watch the movie um then maybe this is not an episode for you um but the two blogs we're going to be talking about today are two members from the road detection teams and they have actually been so amazing as um, an organization that's been working with lonely conservationists for a while they're really uh, keen to engage a lot of the team members in sharing their stories and lonely conservationists and I'm really glad that they have done because I went to a conference last year where it talked about um, a lot of projects that were having dogs helping them track down invasive species or um, conservation like priority species and I didn't really know about conservation dogs being a thing and then all of a sudden I was getting all these blogs from rogue detection teams and seeing these lectures about how people are using dogs in Australia as well so I thought this would be a really cool opportunity to talk about um, Jake's blog and also Jennifer's blog both of them I will link in the show notes so you can read at your discretion so I thought I would start with Jake's blog because it's a bit of a, it gives more of an insight about what it takes to kind of to be someone that works with conservation dogs. And it gives more of a, an introduction to the process of becoming a conservation dog co-worker. Read on. So Jake says, as I lay on a large expanse of granite trying to warm up after an exceptionally cold swim in a glacier fed alpine lake, I look over at my co-worker, Ranger, savouring the life-giving sunshine and cool mountain breeze. I can't help but reminisce on just how far the two of us have come together over the past three years. At first glance, Ranger might seem to be like any other co-worker. He is supremely focused on getting the work done, loves to hike long distances, and always brings a positive attitude to the office. However, if you take a look, you might notice a few distinctions. He has a short, nub-like tail, overly muscled, stubby legs, and ears that bear striking resemblance to those of Dobby the house elf from Harry Potter. That's because Ranger, my co-worker, is a wildlife, detec wildlife detection dog with rogue detection teams. So I think the rogue detection teams mainly are tracking scats. Their dogs are mainly tracking scats to detect wildlife, where a lot of the lectures that I sat in were dogs tracking plants and they were doing tests of like how good the humans were at uh, identifying the plants versus the dogs how good the dogs were at identifying the plants so I think no, depending where wherever you are in the world they'll use conservation dogs for different things but I think um, according to Jennifer and Jake's blog they're mostly focused on finding scats so. I know in my experience dogs are very good at finding poop <laughs> Okay, so Jennifer has lovingly um, given us a bit more information about this. She says, while a lot of our work is scat, we also do invasive species, toxins in the environment, and live animal searches. One myth we are working to dispel is that a conservation dog can only do one odour or one species, when in fact they are incredibly adaptable. One dog can be cross-trained to detect different odours. We have one dog imprinted on over 30 plus odours, and when... The we get asked, how does the dog know when they are on a cougar project and not a bobcat, if they are trained in both fields? This is when the skills of the handler come into play. We don't just rely on our dog's noses. It's a team effort and we become scatologists, using visuals to help us ID scats. A good team will be more effective together as we are two observers in the field as opposed to one. I can either reward and not collect the unwanted target or not reward and the dog will eventually, eventually learn. Oh, okay, not this species on this project. So basically, we talk a lot in this podca 
podcast about how the dogs and the humans need to work closely together as a team. And I think in this, in terms of like looking for scats, this is a good example when the smells of the dogs and the visuals of the people are a good companion, um, like a good companion pair for each other to get the work done. So thanks Jennifer for giving us a bit more information about this. <laughs> okay, so um, how Jay got into this was he actually read an article about an organization that rescues high drive sheltered dogs and gives them an outlet for their obsessive drive by teaching them how to sniff for wildlife signs on conservation projects. And these wildlife signs, as we discussed, are usually scouts. Um, he immediately emailed the program asking for any information they could give about how to get involved with this obscure field. And to his surprise, they actually emailed him back. And he ended up going to a meeting in Washington. Uh, no, he ended up going to a meeting in Minnesota, which is freezing. I don't know if any of you watch Fargo, but that's my only experience with Minnesota. Yeah. And it looks very cold. But Jake was kind of taken aback by how intense the dog's drive was to they were so obsessed with fetching the ball despite like the really chilly conditions and i think that's what hooked jake is how kind of obsessive these dogs were yeah so they come from shelters shelters mm -hmm. like the really rowdy ones <laughs> they'll get those because they're going to be doing a lot of walking yeah a lot of chasing after balls yeah um, that's how they reward them. So when they find the right scat, then then they would throw a ball. And so it's not like a treat reward, it's a fetch reward. Okay, so Jennifer actually says, while our program adopts dogs who are fetch obsessed, some programs will utilize dogs who are treat or food motivated, like myself. <laughs> in fact, I believe a program in Australia, Skyloss Ecology, works with dogs who are treat motivated. So each program is slightly different. And I can relate to that. I'm in Australia and I'm very treat motivated. So um, I guess the thing to note here is not all conservation dog efforts are fetch motivated. There are some treat motivated ones as well. Yeah. Um, so... Then after Jake did that first meeting in Minnesota, he then got accepted into a training class in Washington state. He said, it's very difficult to hire for detection dog work as it takes a unique person to hike around for eight hours off trail solo while working together with a bull crazy shelter dog. And some of the conditions that um, both Jake and Jennifer describe are pretty intense. Like I feel like they have to be mountain goats sometimes like scaling <laughs> cliff faces and really rough terrain glaciers like pretty insane stuff and also it's very isolating because you and your dog might be out there alone for days on end with no um phone reception or anything so it seems like very tough work so although you might want to get into working with um conservation dogs because you think oh like it would be cute to have a dog as a companion it turns out that the work is pretty grueling and then it's just you and your dog out there in the wilderness for like, and I know in the last episode I said I hate people using the word wilderness, but like. That is the correct word in this I case. I think I'm really imagining the wilderness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he, uh, Jake goes on to say, it turns out training was different to anything that I could ever expect. One might think that it takes a long time to train a wildlife detection dog, but the dogs can be trained in a matter of weeks. It's the handler that takes several months and even a couple of years of instruction before being able to effectively communicate and work with a dog in the field. And that's, I think, the common theme between these stories is I learned that it's more the dog teaching the, tr the trainer than it is like the trainer teaching the dog. Yeah. Um, where am I? The reason being, just about every problem a person might be having with a dog can be traced back to poor communication between handler and dog, and many people do not accept this critique very stoically. Dogs are adept to reading and sniffing human body language, as well as sub subtle shifts in our moods. We are in constant communication with them, whether we know it or not. And I think that might be challenging, as you might be in a shitty mood, and you might be trying to encourage your dog, but then yeah. it can tell you're in a shitty mood and he might pick that up. So I think that must be really challenging the first time you realize is that you're constantly communicating with your dog through your like sense that you're putting off and your small behaviors. Like with humans, you're kind of more in control about how you communicate, but with dogs, like you're always communicating, like they pick up everything. Yeah, you can't just tell a dog like, oh, don't worry about this one little detail <laughs> about how I'm acting today. I yeah. need you to focus on this instead. Like they're just 
Yeah. They're just absorbing everything. Yeah. So he says, therefore, every exercise and training question we received in the class was focused on getting the trainees to think from the dog's perspective. At first, this was quite a challenge. I failed more often than I succeeded, and no matter how bad I wanted it, sheer force of will was not enough to change my old thought process. Dogs are not machines. It takes creating teamwork and a bond between a human and dog to be able to work well together. It took a long time, but I eventually started to consistently think in this new way. And it was one of two people from my tra- oh, and I was one of two people from my training class to be hired. That is met when I met Ranger. So I think like when he saw the ad, his perception of what it would be like to work with dogs was very different from when he was actually in the training. And I think that must come as a shock to the system when you're kind of used to everything in our lives, technology, I think pet dogs even, we think that we are in control and we can be like, okay, do this and things will happen. I kind of learned that working with monkeys is sometimes like <laughs> they don't play by your rules <laughs> and you yeah. have to use like reverse psychology or be like just think in a different way, restructure your brain to communicate. And I think it's, it's not an easy thing to do to just restructure your whole way of thinking, but very important for this job. So, sounds tricky. <laughs> so he said in the beginning, Ranger was very challenging to work with because he wouldn't give the ball back. Also alerted him to every scat there was, not just the species that he was supposed to be alerting. And he just ran around um, like a chicken with his head cut off. So I can imagine like you've gone through all this rigorous training. <laughs> it's like you fought hammer and tongue, hammer and tongue. I don't know if that's a Kath and Kim phrase or is a real phrase. What? <laughs> Tooth and hammer? Is that the real one? No. What is the real phrase? You made me confused. It's um, tooth and nail. Tooth and nail. Hammer and tongs. <laughs> That's definitely a Kath and Kim phrase. You... <laughs> anyway, they fought tooth and nail um, to like get this position, and then he finally gets the position. And Ranger is just like not cooperating, and you can't just be. So like... if Ra- if you like, give me the ball, Ranger, and Ranger is like, just hangs no. on to it. <laughs> I think many people have experienced this playing fetch with a dog. <laughs> Is he, he Jake saying like this is Jake's fault, not Ranger's fault? Mm-hmm. Well, because it's like it's different when it's your job. Like you have a job to do, you have to work out how to communicate with your coworker. And like if it was like just Gerald from like IT, you'd be like Gerald, pick up your act. We've got a report due. Yeah. But with Ranger, you can't be like we have a deadline. Please <laughs> stop messing around. <laughs> Right. So I think just learning to communicate and form a team and trust with. So what I was saying before of like there, there'll be lots of people who are like, "Oh, Rangers is a bad dog. Yeah, not giving me the ball," when like clearly you're just not communicating well enough yeah. with Ranger. You need to form that team, and I think this is what comes up again and again in these blogs is that it's really important that you establish a bond. Because Ranger knows them. if he gives you the ball, he might not get it back for ages. <laughs> Until he's found a proper scout. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So they ended up working in many remote locations together in really challenging terrain. Like we said before, no communication to the outside world. And Jake had to learn over that time from Ranger how to work together, trust each other and build a bond. And then he finished the blog with stealing another glance at Ranger, basking in the warmth of the mountain sun. I realized that although life of wildlife Although the life of wildlife detection dog team can be lonely and difficult, none of us are ever truly alone as long as we have our canine companions alongside us. I feel more fortunate than most in our field precisely because I always have my canine counterpart with me to ward off the really lonely nights and quiet days. And, like, I look at their work and I think I could not do that. But also I've thought mm. about like all the times that I've been alone in a hut or alone in somewhere in conservation work and like I would have loved to have had at least a dog companion with me. How lonely can you feel if you've got a ranger next to you? So I feel like... A little bit less. Yeah, it's still... I think there's something to be said. Well, one detail I want to point out, of, yeah. like this isn't just, you know, going for a walk with your dog. One of these trips he was doing was for an entire month just literally backpacking like n- off trails mm-hmm. no phone reception no car just walking for a month straight out there like that's more than just like a weekend camping trip yeah. so like it is just on its own yeah very tough and exhausting and if you didn't have phone reception or if you didn't have human contact with someone else for that whole month 
your there's like humans need social interaction to survive mm. like we we just have these cognitive um needs of like we're social animals so i think without having ranger there it would have been almost impossible to spend a month just working on your own i mean people do it there's people out there who work independently and there's i mean good that he has ranger but i can understand like how lonely it can feel but how thankful you'd feel just to have ranger there and also like how the bond has that chance to develop when it's only you two like you can be mm. pissed off at each other but in the end like you're all each other has like <laughs> i think there's nothing that bonds two people or like two individuals together more than just being alone for a month <laughs> You're either I, I think in quarantine love each other or hate each other in yeah. quarantine people have realized this yeah <laughs> they have to sort out their niggles or they have to quit um so that was jake's story about ranger um and now let's go on to jennifer and max which is the one that has left some tears in todd's eyes okay so when i so jennifer's blog kind of jumps around a bit in timeline so i've tried to like structure it so i can just go through it in a like share her story in a more streamlined way so if we end up jumping little critique around, of jennifer's writing is, style no, i love the style of jennifer's blog but i think for me talking about it and moving back and forth it might get confusing because todd critiques me in other blogs uh, in other podcasts by saying that uh, I tr- I summarize something that's already been summarized, <laughs> and it just like it's it's hard for you as a listener to understand when I have I've already read it from the source and and summarized it, but then I can't communicate what's actually happening. So I just want to let you know that if I'm jumping around a bit, it's just because the blog is in a re- is written in a really beautiful way that kind of you know like those stories that's like back in the summer. And then moving forward to now. <laughs> so uh, it's harder when you're talking about it to kind of get that. I feel like you've spent longer explaining yourself, your choice of explaining the blog than you would have spent explaining the blog. <laughs> okay, let's go on. <laughs> okay, so when Jennifer first got the job, she heard all these dogs barking like when she first walked into the office and it kind of like took her aback. She mentions being kind of like, more of a cat person and they were really quiet and nice and like the jarringness of all these crazy hyper dogs was a bit like yeah she said like for her like going in nature and walking through it alone was just very you know calm and quiet <laughs> and then it's like oh now you're gonna have like these rowdy dogs with you as well <laughs> yeah. um so she even considered that maybe this was not the job for her but when she first met Max. She was a new trainee on what was supposed to be a temporary four-month summer research study where she was supposed to survey northern spotted owls in California, which uh, the rogue detection dogs, I think, would just find the scats of these owls. But um, she says that Max chose her and she saw him like when she was in the office and there was like, he was on the other side of the fence and apparently he was just very like doling out a lot of love and affection and was following her around and she kind of instantly felt this connection with Max, who was um, one of the road detection pups. So adorable. Uh, So it got to the point where it's like a little crush where she was always thinking about Max, even when she was out on jobs with other dogs. (laughs) She was still thinking about Max, which I think is really adorable. Um, So she eventually got to do one job with uh, Max and then ended up begging her boss to go out in the winter surveys with him um so she ended up getting to spend a lot of time with him but she says max was a spunky white whiskered paper eating sweet natured rascal he was also obsessed with playing fetch a requirement for all rogue detection team dogs rogue detection team is a conservation detection dog program currently with 16 fetch obsessed rich energy detection job um high energy detection dogs, all rescued from shelters or owner releases. We work with the dogs to be scent detectors of scats, toxins, plants, or other animals, and then deploy them on projects with their bounders, which are another name for handlers, to locate specific data. My dogs and I have surveyed for species as diverse as African lion, cheetah, pangolin, storm petrel, wolf, and cougar, and even orca, which she says orca scats float, which I had no idea that like, if an orca poops, it just rises to the top of the ocean. <laughs> what's, yeah, what's the setup there? Is like her and the dog just 
in floaties going through <laughs> the ocean. Can you imagine? Um, I think they would like wash up onto land. Jennifer, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Again, Jennifer has come to save the day, so she says, to share a little bit about orca scat. The whales come to the surface to poo, which I had no idea about. The dog is on the bow of the boat following 500 metres far behind, so as not to take from an endangered species, i.e. get so close that it is disturbing to them. And by following the wind and the waves, not the actual whales, we position the boat in the scent cone and wait for the dogs to alert. Once they have an odour, we follow their nose, i.e. their nose leads the boat driver, who is taking the cues from the handler, into the source of the odor before it sinks how crazy is that i had no idea that conservation dogs are used on boats um and i had no idea that orca scats floated and <laughs> i didn't even know that whales went to the surface to poop so there you go um thank you so much again jennifer for clearing this up for us we were floundering along in the dark wondering why and how you could track orca scats <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just very interested in this orca scat situation. <laughs> um, so she says she's lived in bush camps with chatty hyenas as neighbours, backpacked through the stunning backcountry of places like Yosemite Natural Park, slept in jungle hammocks in Cambodia, battled blood-sucking leeches in Vietnam, and taking all means of travel from helicopters, snowmobiles, and rickety boats to arrive at remote field destinations to survey for cryptic odours. So I think that gives a, a lot of context of like the lengths that they go to to collect this data on endangered species. Because I thought it was just like a North American... Yeah, me too, actually. Organization. Yeah. But yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah, so if you feel like you're somewhere in the world and could handle the life of months walking on end with a rowdy dog, this may be the career path you never even consider. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of people who do want to do it, but maybe we can't cut out. Yeah. Like uh, Jake mentioned with the getting the job, eight people. Eight people survived for a month and then Hunger Games style, only two come out. Yeah, so Jake was like really lucky as like one of two people to get that position. And so it you could get so far as to like be selected for the training and then your journey ends there basically. So what if you just have an annoying bratty dog and it just doesn't <laughs> give you the ball? Didn't you learn from Jake? The problem is you. <laughs> Apparently. Um, so she goes on to say that um, Max understood in his very nature that for them to work together they needed to have a bond so she had to learn much like jake did with ranger that max wasn't a tool to be handled and she wasn't a dog handler rather max taught her what it was like to become a bounder and that meant that they had to be bound by a common goal which was their task at hand finding the scats or the odors or whatever they were finding and also she says you also have to be bound by love which I think Todd was not prepared for. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Todd wishes that I issued him a warning before I made him read this book. He did not handle it well. <laughs> she says that, um, yeah, I said this before, but she basically fell head over heels for, Ma uh, for Max and after their first um, job together, basically begged her boss to work together over the winter until the spring. So they had a lot of time to bond. But then she goes... That leaves me confused of, like, how the system... Like, if it is so much about the bond between yeah. the person and the dog, like, wouldn't, wouldn't you be much better off, like, if you just stuck with one dog? Mm -hmm. Or are the dogs, they are different in different places? Well, I think so. If she was a trainee, like, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but if she was a trainee, then they might not have known which dog she meshed well with yet and i wonder if there's a process where they try you trial you out with a few dogs to see like which one you connect with and which one you work well with yeah. maybe like sometimes they get it right straight off the bat and you work together and maybe other times you just connect better with other dogs because i think if there was a obvious pairing for person and dog you'd get better results from it and probably that would it would be worth putting those pet that pair together yeah but I'm not sure how the process works of um, dog selection. But I, like she mentioned at the start of the blog that she was a trainee. So maybe like if when you're a trainee, you're not really settled in the job and you don't have much like choice about what you do. Whatever the logistics, it led to a uh, star-crossed lovers situation. Yeah. You best believe 
Jennifer filled us in on the logistics. So she says, great question about how the program is set up, read the bond. Todd asked this, he sure did. <laughs> Every program is different. So some programs have one dog for one handler and they work all the time together. We like the ability to work with each of our dogs so that we become more well-rounded handlers or bounders. In this way, we avoid developing bad habits, which can happen if we were to focus on just one dog. That being said, over the years we develop strong bonds with one or two of our dogs, and as we get on, and as we go on more projects together, it becomes clear that when the dog reaches retirement, they will retire in the care of a particular bounder based on the love that developed. So that's actually an interesting point which I didn't consider. I guess if you're working with one dog all the time, you could I guess develop bad habits or get lazy with some things. <laughs> um, but that's really cute that the dogs can retire with their favorite bounder. So that's a really good system. And I'm sure that uh, conservation dog programs all around the world do it differently. Um, I'm, I bet there are some that do match handlers with dogs, but for the rogue detection teams, all the handlers work with all the dogs. So yeah, thank you, uh, Jennifer, for clearing that up. It's very beautiful. If you want to read a beautiful romance story, this is the blog for you. Um, so she said, Max retired from field work last year after 10 years in the field. He was 14. Soon thereafter, I learned that he had a rare cancer. What should have been his golden years, getting to chase balls wherever he wanted or sleeping by a cozy fire, we spent precious days traveling back and forth to the vet for chemotherapy treatments and blood work checkups. Matt has always, Max has always been eager for an adventure and jumped in my car ready to explore new scents, but he came to avoid the car, drawing back, ears flat, tail tucked. I would sit on the floor with him as he received IV treatments of invisible drugs that were supposed to help save him. Losing Max would be devastating, and I never felt alone until I realised I was losing Max. Heartbreaking. <laughs> Just because he was so excited to get in the car because he thought it was a new adventure and then he didn't want no, to go in the car. No, he going to the vet. Yeah. That would be really horrible because something like a cancer is very strong, is like very drawn out. It's not like if you had a dog that was hit by a car or something and it was very unexpected and instantaneous. It's a very different pain than watching a dog suffer for a long time and having hope that he could get better but then seeing him, his behavior change and his health change over a long period of time. And especially like if you've read The Fault in Our Stars by John Green and you see what it's like when the characters fall in love but they both have cancer, it's very <laughs> tragic. It's like you want to tell the book to go sit in the corner and think about what it's done to you. <laughs> There's a reason cancer is like the most terrifying disease we have. Yeah, it's really indescribably horrible yeah um so unfortunately max did pass at the start of covid but because it was at the start of covid it made it really challenging for jennifer to say goodbye properly um thankfully the vet was really understanding and brought him out to the car park where it was like legal for them to see each other and have all the the safe distancing and everything um but i thought this blog was a really beautiful kind of like tribute and ode to max because I don't, I, there's never even been a blog where it's talked about like a conservationist human that people have been really inspired by that they've like written about in this way. And it just makes me think that like, you know, like one of my, I've said this before in another blog, but one of my proudest moments was when I had learned a language and a culture and was able to connect with people in a way that I never thought was possible. And it required a lot of work. If you're forming a relationship with a dog, it might be kind of the same feeling of you've had to put in a lot of work to relearn how to communicate and think and change your behavior and connect with them. That when you do eventually have that breakthrough, it's very rewarding mm -hmm. because you've put so much time and effort into forming that relationship and working together. So I just thought that this blog was so beautiful and it did touch a lot of people. So I thought I had to put that in. I hope. Um, Jennifer, that you are healing and that uh, you still carry Max with you when you go on your jobs. Max for best dog. Max for best 14 dog. 14 out of 10. <laughs> Sorry, Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I just thought, like, this is super interesting because obviously people who are working with detection dogs, they're facing a lot of things from, like, the rough terrain to the long hours to time away from their friends and family to the remoteness, the loneliness, and then you have, like, 
the heartbreak of of potentially losing your dogs and she said that that um max wasn't the first detection dog to die from cancer because i think because these dogs are shelter dogs you don't know really what's happened to them in their past Mm. so they could come with medical issues that you weren't expecting and i just feel like working in a situation where you're working with dogs or other conservation animals it's there's differences that are like more challenging than working with humans even from like that fragility you you can't really control the longevity of the the animal that you're working with yeah yeah so i thought like this was a really an interesting one for for me to want to talk about because i have never worked with any conservation animal so this is yeah it's a whole world that neither of us knew anything about yeah so did you know that there was conservation dogs before you read these books no no so yeah i didn't know about them until i literally i read the blogs and then i like went to this conference where i learned about them but before it was like nothing 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 and then they exist to me yeah (laughs) so it's just interesting that like a lot of people might not know that this is a world that's out there and that this is maybe a potential job that if you're listening to this podcast and you think like whoa i thought i had to be a scientist or like they are scientists but like i thought i had to be an academic in an office or in a lab or like this could be a new field of work that you just had no idea exists. So um, rogue detection teams on Instagram are really, really lovely, uh, a really great community of conservationists. So if you are interested in um, checking out what they do or finding out more information, then definitely go say hello because they're so friendly. And I, yeah. I know that they're always trying to convince more of the team to share stories. And I think like it's really great that they're doing that because so little people know about uh, conservation dog work the more that they share their stories with us the more we can kind of learn what they're doing and, and be empathetic to what they have to go through so jennifer has lovingly given us some advice of what you can do if you want to get into working with conservation dogs and she she suggests finding a mentor she says find a person or program that has been doing this for some time and can share the best practices we are each ambassadors of this work so it is up to us to ensure that if we work in this field we can indeed work with our canine partners to locate data on rare or cryptic species and odors so i guess the first thing is you'd want to make sure you have some kind of ecology background and you can identify different scats and plants and species of animals and everything. So you'd need that kind of background. But also, um, as we've seen in Jennifer and Jake's blogs, you need to be more than just someone that gets along with dogs. Um, Jennifer was a cat person. (laughs) So you need to be someone that can be a colleague of a dog. And the best way to find out if that's you is to have a chat to someone that's already working in the field, kind of like Jake did of sending them an email and just getting in touch. So if you are interested in getting into this field, reach out to a conservation dog program, find yourself a mentor, and maybe this is your new job. Who knows? Yeah, it is like just really beautiful imagery if you just read about it of like yeah just a person and a dog traveling around yeah doing science it seems like a hollywood movie yeah <laughs> it's crazy because like both jennifer and, and jake write so beautifully like <laughs> do they get trained to be authors <laughs> at rogue detection team like yeah. the way they tell their stories is just so poetic and i don't know if like if you're in challenging landscapes or beautiful picturesque 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 i got there in the end. um landscapes and like you kind of feel like you're you're alone and you play out these scenes in your head maybe you've already rehearsed your story i guess so yeah like if you have so much time alone to think about i'm imagining yeah like sitting on the ridge of a mountain with a giant lake in the distance and snow cat peaks and you're just like writing your little leather bound journal like yeah <laughs> that's what i'm picturing that will Please, Jake, Jennifer, let us know if that's your reality because (laughs) you guys are amazing writers and the way you capture the imagery of what you experience, I feel like we both can really like resonate with what you're talking about even though it's such a different world to what we've ever experienced on our own. Yeah. Jennifer gave me the longest email I've ever received with so many detailed notes about conservation dogs and all these exciting contributions to the podcast. But Jennifer, 
Where is the information about sitting sultrily on a mountain with a leather-bound journal, scribbling away your romantic thoughts about the countryside? Uh, unfortunately, we still have no further news on this, so we just have to imagine that that's what they do. That's just if you're gonna be a conservation dog um, employee, you just have to buy yourself a leather-bound journal and feel your emotions just get in touch with them because i think that's an important part of the job description so this one's going to be hard but what can we do to help people who are working with non-human colleagues like because this is something that this is the topic that's probably the furthest from what i've ever experienced like i don't think i've done anything remotely close to this before yeah okay so because we don't know what we're talking about because we've never experienced working with conservation dogs or any other animals as conservation colleagues um jennifer has her final update which is what we can do to help people who have little pups as their co-workers so she says i think the biggest takeaway is that people ask themselves can i or should i be doing this I think the method looks so pretty from the outside looking in and there are so few jobs in this field that people decide to go about pursuing this on their own. But that might actually be the worst thing possible, both for the dogs as well as for the method. If there was just one paper or article that highlights how the method does not work, that sets us all back. That means we are unable to grow in this field and offer more jobs to new bounders as well as adopting more dogs because researchers lose faith that it works. So the best thing that people can do to help is not try and reinvent the wheel or attempt to do this on their own. We have over 20 years of both building as well as making mistakes. Seeking a mentor in the field to guide best practices is a great place to start. It might mean that a person will have to accept that they are not an ideal bounder, but that's okay. Instead, maybe a person could raise awareness that shelter dogs are capable of conducting conservation work or that there is a non-invasive way of collecting data. A person could apply for a grant to conduct non-invasive wildlife research using a detective, a detective, a detection team, sorry, hire a professional detection team. And once a paper is published highlighting that the method works, that person will know that they are contributing to valuable science. Another idea is to collaborate on a paper with a detection dog program. We don't often have the time to do this part of the work because we're so often in the field. But if we, and by we, I mean other detection dog groups too, can get papers published highlighting that the method works, this would be assisting in setting a precedence for this in the field and thus providing a backbone in which the method would become more widely used and dependable. So, uh, don't just willy-nilly take your dog out to try and do conservation dog works that's actually more harmful than it is good but if you love writing scientific papers which is something i despise greatly <laughs> um, you can help out detection dog teams by getting some of their research published because i think that's the thing with a lot of conservationists is we have a lot of time in the field and that takes away from actually sharing our research with others so uh, if you are not the ideal candidate to be a bounder for whatever reason, there are still other ways you can help uh, conservation dogs and their colleagues. And it, it'd, be, it'd be hard to tell people about because it would be a different relationship than with your household pet. Yeah, for sure. Like there's a difference between your pet and your colleague. And yeah. I think like, so Jake talks about he grew up with dogs and he's used to dogs but it was still so challenging for him to rework his mindset and to like he said he failed a lot in the training because no matter how much he was used to dogs he wasn't used to forming that working relationship with the dog well i was just thinking for for them to like yeah talk to the friends and family and like tell people about this it'd be really hard because yeah you you spend so much time away from your family and friends mm -hmm. and then you go back and it's like oh how was it and like how do you you know, how do you, how do you tell people like, oh, I have this really special bond with this dog now? Mm. I think like, oh yeah, I love my pets as well. Like, no, no, it's different. It's different. Yeah, it's also interesting because like, I hate when people say, "How was it to me when I come back from six months somewhere?" Like, how do you describe six months of turbulence, ups and downs, <laughs> with one sense? Oh yeah, it was good. Thanks. Like, it wasn't yeah, good. Great times. It was sometimes exciting. It was sometimes life threatening. It was sometimes I was crying alone. <laughs> like sometimes I had builders peeking through the windows at me like how can I answer like how was it <laughs> yeah I think people should stop asking that 
how was it but like i think people should Please tell me about your trip i think people should be still engaged in these conversations but in a way that's very like not bringing anything of yourself to the table i think when you listen to people's trips everyone has such like profound things happening to them like you talk about like you used to have a colleague that went to south africa and he came back and he's like obsessed with south africa and it's like his experience was life-changing to him no matter like and this is kind of his time or our time to listen to how that changed his life without being like oh yeah i went to south africa too because i think like when you go away sometimes it like it it is this pivotal aha moment in your life where you're like oh i've unlocked this something within me and i think talking about it with people who don't really understand or who are not taking the effort or the time to really understand you almost feels like they're cheapening what you've gone through or they it almost hurts more when they don't try to understand so i think like there's an important thing to say here about having conversations with people that is really active listening based instead of just like conversation based because i think no amount of light conversation could have pervaded what jake and jennifer have talked about in their blogs like just the raw emotion and like how challenging everything is that needs to come across yeah the way they describe it it is like that that mix of it's really challenging and really hard but also the best thing ever yeah i think a lot of things in conservation are exactly that juxtaposition of like this is the hardest shit ever but also i can't imagine my life without it i'm so lucky to have this job yeah so i think like this job is like the extreme version of that (laughs) where it's like the hardest hard but like the most joyous joy um so i think like yeah this is a good one where it's really important to take the time to read these stories and to learn and and to almost like take the time to look at like unconventional jobs in the industry and maybe this is a good opportunity to think like if you didn't know that this job existed how many other jobs in conservation are out there waiting for you that you just didn't know was a thing at least six at least six (laughs) and like how much our closed-mindedness to like just say if everyone perceives conservation to be like you get a degree you get a job like surveying plants as an ecologist that's your life how much does that closed-mindedness restrict conversations with others or empathizing with others about their roles in the industry as well yeah so i think it would be actually interesting jennifer and jake if you have anything to add here about what people what you wish people would help you out with or what people would react to or like how do you wish people would help you in your careers because i really don't think todd and i are in any position to even come up with (laughs) with solutions for you so it'd be really good to have um, i was just gonna say my first reaction i I remember you telling me a lot because i'm educated about these things (laughs) of like oh, you know, introduced species of dogs and cats, they tend to ruin, like, native environments. But he is, like, you know, an introduced species helping. I I, like the idea of that. I never even thought of that. It's like a a twisty twist at the end. (laughs) I wonder if they could train foxes, because, like, foxes are a (laughs) pest species here in Australia. They're so cunning and so smart. Like, Todd's favourite movie is Fantastic Mr. Fox. Like, (laughs) he knows how smart foxes are. And they're like... Could we be training the foxes to turn from the bad guys to the good guys? No, they're too smart. They're too smart? Yeah. It's like octopus where... So there's <laughs> this study where they, like, try to, um, like, test octopus to see if they can do all these behaviours. And they're just like, I can, but I'm not going to do that behaviour for your, like, shitty piece of squid. I want the prime cut of fish. And then <laughs> maybe I would do this, what you want me to do. Yeah. So it's like you have like the levels of smartness like they're trying to like see like (laughs) oh can they like open this jar that actually is like actually beyond opening the jar they are now like actively bartering (laughs) with the scientists yeah and it's just like shows how much what they're thinking about maybe you need a like certain type of intelligence for these kind of roles like you don't need too cocky of an intelligence like you just need smart enough to do the role but not smart enough to like barter with you if they don't feel like doing the role you know (laughs) so 
Yeah, I think this was a really a good... Um, both of these blogs is like super well-written and really important for a lot of us to read. And I think I didn't want... I know we talk about like racism and LGBT and like chronic illness and a lot of heavy things in this second series. But I think like something like this is a good example of when people go through really tough emotional things and heart, like the hardships of working outside in very... Um, intense environments or whatever I think we need to be very em- empathetic towards um, people who are working remotely or doing like um, very intense work because it takes a strain on you mentally and especially like with Jennifer losing someone that she obviously cares for so much and like still being expected to keep up with her job and to work it's just so like experiencing loss is just heartbreaking and often you have to take time off your work and now I can't imagine what Jennifer's life is to have work remind her of Max knowing that she can't do the jobs without him anymore or to go out with another dog and to be like oh but it's not Max so I just want to not cheapen this episode and I want it to like have the gravity that it deserves and I want I guess I want the audience to understand um why I put it in amongst all these other like seemingly heavy topics because I think learning to restructure your life and your brain to do challenging work with a different species as your colleague is like admirable yeah it's yeah it's a whole other dimension of challenges in conservation that not everyone's going to be aware of yeah and like the same I've never experienced chronic illness I've never experienced this either I think for me it's kind of like on the same level of nuance things in conservation that like people have to experience so again thank you so much to rogue detection teams and thank you for jennifer and for jake for telling your stories because they're both so touching so deep so heartfelt and um we would not understand what you do without reading these stories and you even made todd a little emotional which goes to show how good the writing is todd does not get moved easily i feel (laughs) but he is like what the hell did you make me read? Why didn't you give me a warning? <laughs> Very offended that I didn't give him any context to the book. <laughs> you can't just unleash a dog love story where the dog dies in the end on someone. But like, you should definitely read both Jake and Jennifer's blog because I feel like I did not do it justice by talking about it. Like Sometimes I feel like us talking, you kind of get the general gist. But the way that these blogs are written so beautifully, I just feel like you have to read them yourself. Definitely worth a read. Yeah, 10 out of 10. Um, So, yeah, go check out Rogue Detection Teams and um, have a bit of empathy for your colleagues who aren't working with people. So that was the very last episode of the How to Conserve Conservationist Podcast Season 2 all about you thank you so much as i said before for sticking around i've enjoyed every single episode i this has been an amazing experience so thank you all again but keep reading those blogs on lonelyconservationist.com and maybe even submit your own there's so many good ones already out there but they're missing yours i want your stories too um and if we get enough new stories you know maybe season three is around the corner um but yeah check out our instagram at lonely conservationist our twitter at lonely conserve maybe even support our women empowerment program on patreon at patreon.com slash lonely conservationist or maybe even buy my book you know if you haven't read it yet go check it out um you can get it anywhere you get your online books also how to conserve conservationists but thanks again for this amazing season and i'll see you all when i see you bye